All right, everybody. Welcome to Overflow Beyond the Music, the podcast. My name is Josh McCabe, and I am your host. I want to just say real quickly, thank you for all the feedback that we got on that special episode we released with John Cooper. As I mentioned at the beginning of that podcast, that one took a long time to sort of figure out how to how to tackle. And at the end of the day, I felt really, really happy with where we landed. I uh, got a lot of feedback on it and I uh, just want to say, yeah, I really appreciate people taking the time to write in because uh, that's that's what we're about. want to hear from you guys. We want to know what you guys are thinking. want to know what kind of guests you want to have on here. If you've got some suggestions for us, we'll try and find them and we'll see what we can do. But this week, I'm really excited about our guests because... Uh, we're tackling the conversation not so much from uh, a new album coming out or a book or anything like that, but rather uh, what this guy is doing after music. You may have wondered in the intro, what band am I listening to? Who's this rock and roll band? That, my friends, is Audio Adrenaline. Um, man, they are legends in the area of, of Christian music and CCM rock. Released countless albums over multiple decades and, and really... Uh, they they would be in the in the Christian music and I arguably even Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because they have had a huge influence that has transcended outside of just the Christian genre and I uh, have a lot of respect for those guys and even more after getting to hang out with their bass player Will McGinnis and we're gonna get to that conversation in just a second. Well, hey, I've teased in a couple other episodes, but we have a couple of copies of Kim Walker Smith's new book called Brave Surrender, and they are signed by Kim Walker Smith herself. And we've got two of those that we would love to give away to you guys as our listeners. And here's how you're going to do it. If you're not following us on Instagram already, make sure that you do so. If you're not following us on Facebook already, make sure you do so. The place you can find us is over uh, Overflow BTM, just Overflow BTM. That's how you'll find us. And what you're going to do is you're going to open up the Overflow podcast, you're going to turn it on, and you're going to take a screenshot on your phone or your computer or your iPad or wherever you listen to it, and you're going to post it, and you're going to make sure you tag us. You're going to tell people you're listening to the Overflow Beyond the Music podcast, give us a little plug, and send us a screenshot. Make sure that you tag us in it, though, so we can see it. It's at Overflow BTM on Instagram, Overflow BTM on Facebook, and even if you're on Twitter, it's at Overflow BTM on Twitter as well. Make sure that you tag us, though. We're going to be picking two winners to grab those copies of Kim Walker Smith's new book called Brave Surrender. So make sure that you get on that on the social media because we'd love to put a brand new book in your hands. All right, so you may have heard of Audio Adrenaline. You may not have. You may uh, remember them as as the band that was sort of broke out in the late 90s, early 2000s as this, this Christian rock and roll band. And um, later on in their career, we talk a bit about it in this interview, uh, the lead singer, Mark Stewart, loses his voice in the band, ends up calling it quits. And one of the things that they did w- that was really cool as an initiative is the Hands and Feet Project. And I'll let Will talk more about that in this podcast but one of the other things that happened was after the band had gone on hiatus and, and really retired and wrapped up, the band relaunched with uh, Will still on bass, but other members. And they brought in a new lead singer, which ended up being Kevin Max of DC Talk. And I even mentioned it to Will because when I when I saw this second version, I guess, of Audio Adrenaline come out, I wasn't really sure what to think of it or what it was about. But listen to this interview because you begin to hear the heart of why they decided to bring back the band and what the motives were. And they're actually really pure. And I have a whole new respect for Audio Adrenaline, and especially Will McGinnis after this interview. But taking us into this interview right before we hear from Will, here's a clip of the song Kings and Queens with Kevin Max singing by Audio Adrenaline. Check it out. Boys become kings, girls will be queens, wrapped in your majesty. All right, what's up, everybody? Um, so, being new to Tennessee, well, still, I still feel new. I feel like I say that every episode, but I've been here about seven months, <laughs> and awesome. I, I thought I lived south of the city, um, but I'm here in like, <laughs> I'm here on like a little ranch, like a little farm. You're way out south. Yeah, so I'm I'm in the south end of Franklin, and and it goes further south, and I'm here with Will McGinnis, bass player, um, advocate for. <laughs> the least of these oh. um, bass player from a- audio adrenaline um, is where a lot of you will recognize him from, but how are you doing, man? I'm doing awesome. I'm doing way awesome. Thank you. I'm honored to get to, to be on here with you. feels like a, another life that I was, when I hear you say bass player for audio a, that was, feels like another life ago, but yeah. 
It does feel like another life for me in in some senses as well because, I mean, I I grew up going to like Christian shows, right? Like my I said this in another interview I had, but my dad kind of had this rule that like he really wanted me to listen to Christian rock. He he made yeah. Christian rock. He yeah. thought Christian rock was great. He's a legend, yeah. Daniel Band, <laughs> yeah, yeah. influence on the Christian scene. Totally. One, one might call him a pioneer, which he's go. not sure he he not sure how he feels about that. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I, he, I join him in that. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. He um I mean he would take me to any Christian concert that would be in the vicinity of Toronto or wherever. Yeah. And uh, I saw you guys live many, many a times. That's awesome. My yeah. Probably my fondest memory was, um, I think I saw you guys at Liberty University. Okay, yeah. And I remember like this like huge like white sheet in front and then it like dropped <laughs> and it was like, it was, like whoa. Yeah, the classic reveal. It was so shadow, good. <laughs> so stuff. rock and roll. Oh, thank you. Yeah, man. Well, hey, it's it's good to have you here. And we'll talk a little bit about the audio A stuff, but also I really want to get into what you're doing now um, yeah. with work in Haiti because that, that is... Um, that's why we're getting together to talk about that. But yeah, that's cool. Tell me a little bit about what post touring music, <laughs> show playing, studio making life has been like. I mean, yeah, I just heard that you have a daughter going to college tomorrow. I know it's crazy. Yes, I know. I yeah, I take her off to Lee University. My uh, my middle child, Addison, my daughter. Yep, got three kids and. Um, yeah, oldest Satchel uh, is 20, and then my younger one's still in high school, 16, Fallon. So, yeah, so post um, Audio A, Mark lost his voice, just to kind of roll back a little bit, in um, 2007, came off the road for about five years. I w- created a little uh, horse boarding business on my uh, farm and did that for a season, and then talks kind of came around about us going out with Audio A 2.0. And yeah. The real heart behind that was to kind of give hands and feet some mm-hmm. kind of needed um, uh, stage again. You know, it, yeah. it, it had a stage with Audio A when we were out, and then when we came off the road because of the Mark losing his voice, it just kind of had lost that voice a little bit. Even mm-hmm. though Mark and I, Mark was running hands and feet, and I was on the board, chair of the board, and yeah. my wife is uh, deeply involved in in hands and feet, and so. Uh, we just really thought that it would be great to re- make another record around hands and feet. We called it Kings and Queens. It was about all of our, all of our uh, students down in Haiti. We had mm-hmm. 117 students that we care for down there. So that R- Kings and Queens record, wa- I went back out and toured that for about two and a half years, and it was all about hands and feet. And I thought that that journey had kind of, or that record had kind of done its life cycle, and and we had also got asked to move to Haiti. Um, at the same time. So this was about 2014, um, came off the road and moved my whole family of five to Haiti. Uh, My wife was child care advocate at the time, circle of care uh, director. And um, I was chair of the board still then at that time. And I just come off a season of really champion and the least of these on the road about that record, Kings and Queens. And, uh, and so we moved our whole family, you know, kind of boiled our whole living uh into 15 check bags and went to haiti and it was an incredible season uh got to shepherd our missionaries down there uh my kids got to homeschool for a season uh my wife andrea and i both got to kind of pour into our haitian staff and stand up haitian staff down there to Mm -hmm. care for our kids full time and uh yeah, that was just, you know, it's one of those seasons that you won't ever relive again with your family. It really cemented our, our family together. My wife and I really grew in our marriage. Our kids and I grew, you know, and my wife and I and our kids grew together because really all we had was each other, you know. Mm-hmm. We had our safe space in our house, on the mission field, in Haiti, on the campus of Hands and Feet, and it was an amazing season. God did a lot with us, and He did a lot through us, and He grew our family and uh and then we came home and uh the kids went back to school you know here in here in uh franklin tennessee where they go and um and uh we uh there you go we moved on i my wife uh got uh promoted to executive director kind of took over mark's position and he's out now writing a book and speaking and doing a church tour and and uh advocating for for the least of these still as he always has been a voice for for the the orphan and the abandoned, and then uh, Andrea and I also kind of are 
part of that voice too with Hands and Feet Project, but I also run a work called Haiti Made Today. And um, so there's probably a lot of questions you have about all that, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's sort of the quick uh, rundown for the last uh, several years of, of me and the band and everything else. So I love it because um, I had Adam Ag on the podcast oh, in last crazy. season. Um, yeah, who yeah. <laughs> I love that guy. That's awesome. Um, yeah, Adam's amazing, amazing dude. We shared a bus for like too long yeah, there you <laughs> with go. when yeah. I was playing for a different band. And yeah, um, there you go. I, I kind of asked him. I said, like, what was what was the deal with Audio A? Like, what, what why resurrect that with a different singer? And when he and I wasn't being critical. I was no, just yeah. saying, like, help me well, understand why why this makes sense. Yeah. And when he explained that, I go. Well, I could totally see why this makes sense. Yeah. Because it wasn't about it wasn't about trying to get another number one single. It wasn't about trying to throw a few more Dove Awards on the wall. Yeah. Or even because suddenly no one can pay their bills. It's it wasn't about no, that yeah, at all. Totally. It was all about it was all about advocating. So so tell me what that tension felt like to res to bring back something that yeah. you've probably thought was done. Well, I mean I had actually gotten into some really incredible rhythms at home too with my family. So I didn't want to go back on the road, you know, and Mark's sort of been the catalyst of a lot of the crazy in my life, which is really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> He's, you know, he and I met back when we were 18, you know, on a college campus called Kentucky Christian, you know, university. And I, yeah. uh, he ran into my mom and she overheard, him and uh, his brother talking about a Christian band they were going to start. And she just went up to complete strangers and said, well, you got to get my son, Will, in your band. He plays bass. Amazing. And he ran into me a week later and said, yeah, I ran into your mom. And she said, you're supposed to be in our band we're starting. And that's how I got in Audio Drill. And that's how I met Mark Stewart. So so good. Um, really random things like that that the Lord does. But uh, and then I went to the wrong university, by the way. Well, there you I mean? go. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe yeah. my mom could have told you you need a drummer or something. I don't know. Yeah, there different, you go. Different career life, right? Oh, I love it. <laughs> no, so, I probably yeah, would have so been just, like eight years old anyway yeah, when that right, started. <laughs> right. <laughs> love it. But yeah, to keep going. Tell yeah, me. Yeah, so the, you know, he's the author of our steps and he, he knows the plans he has for us. And I certainly, my, you know, I was thinking about my, my daughter going off to college, you know, and, and my son who's also out, out, you know, in the world and how much we try to steer, steer that as parents. And, um, when really my life just happened supernaturally and very miraculously and through mm-hmm. some weird things, like I chose to go to Christian college very late and it was because of my uncle who had went there he was a teacher. I'm like, I want to be a teacher. I want to influence kids. You know, well, God just had a different idea of how I would influence kids, you know, and young people and encourage uh, the outcasts and the fringe people that I wanted to really reach out to because I came from a broken home. But Mark mm-hmm. and I met, we go to college, we get in this band. It actually, you know, is, is a decent band and we get signed and we go out on every tour that's out there for all these years. And then he loses his voice and the touring season is done, we think. And then um, God had also kind of, in the peripheral realized that I just, I needed, I needed a lot of work on me. You know, I really, I'd really got into some unhealthy things and the identity thing and, you know, what audio was and the place it played in my life was just really unhealthy and was wrong. And, you know, how I supported my family and didn't support my family through all of that. I had, you know, at one point my wife had three kids at home and a diapers, you know, and yeah, here I am out on the road being a rock star and with some of my best buddies living it up and having the greatest life. I don't say that any of that was wrong, uh, but you know, I could have looked at it maybe a little differently, asked some different questions and maybe been the man and the, the person I was supposed to be in my own family, well, you know, it's, first it's, it becomes so. wrong when it's in the wrong place, there when it's go. in the wrong order. Yeah. When you prop, prop things up and put them on the pedestals that we do. And that could be my wife. That could be the band. That could be anything that we put in place of God and his priority. You're right. So, but anyway, so I, um, yeah, I'd gotten into some incredible rhythms post the band and w- had really felt like, man, I, the last thing I want to do is go back out on the road, you know, and, and leave my family again. And, uh, but we all sat around and my wife included, and we said, Hey, if this could really bless hands and feet and could give it the shot in the arm, it needs, give it the mouthpiece it needs. And so, you know, we went out and probably did 150, 200 shows in two oh. and a half years, and um, it got a lot of publicity. It went to the next level. We were able to catapult that into some really great stuff for hands and feet. Yeah. And it catapulted into some really great stuff for my family. As I said, I got to move to Haiti and do that for a season, about a year yeah. and a half. And then it catapulted into my current position of 
of Haiti made. So God knew what he was doing. He knew I needed to be broken from the road and we needed to come off the road. He knew I needed to be rebuilt and some discipline and like actually read a bunch of books and get some counseling and do some other things and Mm -hmm. get my life ready for the next season. And a lot of that happened through Haiti going there and living there and cementing our family back together again, rebuilding it, if you will. And then he knew that I was kind of ready to take a leadership role. So I'm CEO today of Haiti made. And I mean, he, he just did all that, you know, and I, I praise him for that. And I thank him that he still continued to grow me today. And that's kind of what he does with us. He, takes us on this journey and sometimes he has to tear us down to build us back up and sometimes out of the ashes beautiful things come and and new things come and new relational pieces get added to your your family and your life your marriage you know your Mm -hmm. job and so all of that is kind of what's happened in the last uh 10 years you know well i i mean i've seen audio adrenaline more times than (laughs) than i can count that's amazing (laughs) Um, because you guys i mean back when i was just sort of a little little punk kid playing drums for different bands and stuff. Um, you guys would always headline a lot of the festivals. Yeah. And so everyone would stick around and want to watch you guys play. And I just, I love the, the rock and roll Americana vibes that you guys would bring and, uh, the ministry aspect. But well, all this is, is essentially blowing up. You, I mean, you guys could do headline tours back to back to back if you wanted to. Mm. Um, what, what are some of the things that maybe, uh, the, the super CCM Jesus freak fan <laughs> at a Christian yeah. festival is not seeing uh, that's going on in the life of Will McGinnis. Oh man. I mean, it's just like anything, the life of a pastor, the life of a guy in a band, the life of any, you know, a lawyer, a banker, whatever. I mean, you know, there's, there's what you see and then there's what's, you know, really going on and what's deep, you know? So I think like anyone, you know, you, uh, you get in a rock band and it's kind of head down and you're just out there and you're, it's, it, it actually gets pretty easy because you know what you're doing, you know the drill, you're good at it and things are happening and shows are happening. You got your show down, you know, and you got your day, you know, you got, you know, you got sound check and you know, you yeah. got the show and you got what's in between. And, um, but I think that it's just what people are missing is just, uh, that there's trials and struggles in anything. I mean, and then there's just, you know, a um, guy I listen to a lot says you have to work harder on yourself than you do anything else. I mean, mm. if you're missing that that work, that your self-care that you have to do yeah. to be good to anyone, whether you're good in the band, whether you're good to your wife, your kids, I mean, um, if, if that has to originate from your self-care and a big part of your self-care has to be like your intimacy with the Lord, with the God and the God you love and serve and... Um, journeying with Jesus and knowing um, that all sounds pretty cliche, but I mean, it's, it, it is a real, yeah, that's true. it is a real grassroots uh, need for every person on this planet, I believe, to journey first with God and his son, Jesus, and to be tight and to be spending the time there. Jesus went off to pray so many times we saw in his life. And it's because he was doing all the miraculous stuff, but he needed to be refueled. He needed to recharge. He needed to connect with the Father. We got to connect with the Father. If we don't do that, then we're no good to anyone, you know. So for me, I think that in the busyness of Audio A and the busyness of life, you the first thing that gets weeded out often is your your closeness and your time with God, you know, the Father. Um, he said we can call him Abba Father for a reason. You know, he wants that intimacy with us. He wants that communion, if you will. He wants that uh, solace. He wants that uh, taking the time to just soak in him, soak in his word. And um, if you're not doing that, then you're you're not taking care. You're not doing your self-care, you know? Mm-hmm. And then it's reading books. It's getting some counseling. It's identifying things in your past, like being from a broken home and your mom and dad and the, the, the wounds and the scars that they left on you and how that translates to your future family, your wife and your kids. And then if you, that can all kind of snowball and catch up and roll into something that's really massive that the enemy will use to try to take that all out. So I think, um, you know, behind the scenes for me was, um, in audio a I, I there was there was it was an incredible season and we got to go out and champion um 
you know, a lot of cool things and write a lot of great music. And a lot of people said that it carried them through darkest hours and encouraged them. And, Mm -hmm. but, you know, at the end of the day, I needed to take care of me and then my family first, you know, and I don't, I don't think I was always doing that. And I don't think I was always the man of God. I was supposed to be at certain times during that. So was it, was it tough? Cause you said the word earlier, identity. Was it tough to lay down the identity of Will McGinnis, audio adrenaline, touring bass player? Well, I think it just speaks to a, a bigger issue that was in me, and it's just that I had a real uh, insecurity problem. You know, I, I coming from a broken home and and all that I had gone through, and kind of like uh, my journey in life had left me sort of a loner and an outcast in high school, and then. Um, you know, you come from Ohio, and you. I went to to school and got an. I was in, on an education trek, but got in a rock band, and I think I really only felt qualified to do one thing, and it was play bass and audio drilling. So, mm. anything outside of that felt very scary to me. You know, like getting off the road and I was like, well, what would I do? What would I even be qualified for? You yeah. know, I was so limiting in my mind and my scope, and didn't see myself the way others or even God would see me, you know, the potential that there is and the greatness that is in everyone who knows God and also just the innate gifts that he gives us all. We all have something that we're wired to do great, and we all have something that we're supposed to do on this planet. We all have a Mm -hmm. bent, you know, whether we're an encourager or a great leader or whatever, we all have those things that that we're wired to do. And, um, I just felt so little of myself. I thought so little of myself and, and, uh, just perpetuated, you know, the enemy's, you know, self-talk in my mind. And, uh, so I think more of it was, I was afraid about what I could actually do outside of the band less than the identity in the band. I really tried to downplay the band in my mind, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And tried to downplay the fact that I was on a stage and the crowd was down there. I mean, I, I, tried to be very approachable and i think we were a band overall that was very approachable yeah. we, we weren't in the bus all the time we were out having fun with with our fans we signed you know until every last one left you know yeah. we tried to go above and beyond in a lot of those ways to show that we were kind of midwest boys hard mm-hmm. working strap things on our back but we were like a band for the people and specifically for outcasts and fringe you know people who wouldn't automatically walk into church so um I think there was a lot of things in in terms of how we mentally and kind of spiritually looked at our what God had given us. Didn't let mm-hmm. it go to our heads so much. But at the end of the day, you know, there's there's all sides of that that can can uh, consume you and can rule you and can you know, like I said, it just it was like easy. And I thought, well, this is all I know how to do, and it, I could go out and make a living doing it. And plus, it was serving God. And it was doing a lot of good. So there was a lot of great things about it. But I didn't ask the hard question of what does God want me to be doing, you know, at any given point during that. And I should have been asking more of those questions, you know. Do you think that, um, uh, it's it's kind of a tough question to ask, but as I look at, at this, the state of, of quote-unquote Christian music today, uh, I've, I've been on tours with, with bands that I kind of am like, I don't even know if you like doing this anymore. I don't, I don't know, like, I don't even know if you know why you're doing this anymore. Or, you know, I'll see festivals and I'll go, I'll go, like, are you, are you trying to relive your youth group day? Like, are you trying to relive something? And, and do you think that there's a part of, I guess I'm saying, talk to me a little bit about the part of maybe Christian culture that keeps kind of going back to some sort of glory day, but also, um, the real wrestle that you've not picked up a bass to go play live anymore because you've discovered that there's more God yeah. wants to do you like talk about that tension that that might exist because I mean audio adrenaline um like forget Mark's voice like just get Tyler to sing the songs and have Mark just run around and say yell stuff yeah you could headline every festival this a, year we did that for a season <laughs> okay <laughs> okay <laughs> no but uh oh man I mean it's it's like anything in life. I mean, yeah. it's it's you got to have the vision out in front. You got to know what you're chasing. You got to know what you're what you're shooting for. You got to have your passion, your zeal. But you can lose that in anything. You can lose it in Christian ministry. You can mm-hmm. lose it in business. You can lose it in everyday life in your family. Life gets hard. Um, you get old. You lose your energy. I mean, it's just like that is kind of the battle in life. It's 
knowing why you're doing what you're doing and, and the purpose and the passion you have for it. I mean, it's so as a, you know, in a band, I mean, we were in a band for 25 years, you know, yeah. I mean, we had to keep kind of recre- recreating ourselves. And at one point, that's how we, you know, created Hands and Feet Project. We were like, what are we leaving our families for? Why are we doing this? You know, we've lapped the world. We've won a couple Grammys. We've won, we've won lots of Dove Awards. What is the point anymore? We've wrote killer songs, you know, we've, we've been young and full of vinegar and we, you know, got that out of us. Now, yeah. why do we do this? And so we like, and we didn't want to necessarily just sign up for something to be a mouthpiece for that we weren't super, you know, deep about. And so we had a connection to Haiti. Mark's mom and dad had been a missionary there on and off for years. And it was the light bulb went off. We're like, we're supposed to do uh, yeah. something in Haiti and that's going to be our band's new passion. And that's what carried us to the end of our career. We, we got a real heart's passion, but you can mission drift. Like in Haiti, uh, we're, we're there to do orphan care, you know, to care for children, the abandoned, the orphan children of Haiti. But we can also go, wow, the church is really terrible in Haiti. Why don't we create a church? Wow, mm-hmm. the medical needs here are just yeah. incredible. Why don't we create a medical clinic? Wow, the schools here are awful. Why don't we create a school? And then next thing you know, you're doing like everything under the moon, very subpar. We call that mission drift. So it's like you have to focus you have to have a passion and an energy. And if you lose that, you have to just kind of ask the tough questions. This is really hard, too, because you could be making a lot of money at the time. You could be selling a lot of records. You could mm-hmm. be selling out a lot of tickets at a show. And you could just be dead in the water in your mind and in your hearts, you know, uh, in on the inside. And, and the motivation is just completely off off base. It's out of, out of whack. And so that's when the Lord will shake it up sometimes. He'll, he'll create a disruptor. He's very good at creating a disruptor, and I think that um, um, he wants to get our attention a lot of times, yes, you know? yeah. And uh, he'll do that any way he has to. Mm-hmm. He's a jealous God. He wants our attention. He wants our affections. Uh, so He wants us more than he wants our gift. Yeah, there you go. And I mean, it's the gift is a, is a should be a, a offering of worship back to him. Yeah, an know? overflow. Yeah, an overflow of, a, a like I said, an intimacy and a killer journey with him. And but the the, uh, the janitor at the church is giving an incredible overflow and an offering to yeah. uh, to God, and and he is at the pinnacle uh, just as much as any you know uh, major CCM worshiper out there. You know that's that's got a bazillion cuts on CCLI and all of that. You know. Well, you know, I had a conversation with a friend who who kind of left Christian music, um, and you know, he said selling more records than ever, playing arenas now making tons of money. Um, I mean, clearly it's the right move. And I, I said <laughs> quietly, cause I'm not sure I really wanted to get into it at the moment, but I said, but at what cost? Because yeah. you could have all the outside accolades and lose your, what is it to gain the world, but lose your soul? Yeah, there you go. Like age old truth, right? That's right. Do you feel like you've, do you feel like you have found in this season, what your soul truly beats for? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an evolving question. I mean, yeah, an evolving I, journey, I, but I think with anything that is good, you're chasing, it's going to be painful. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a battle. Um, the enemy doesn't want you to be successful at anything. He, he wants to t- like, like the Bible says, he wants to take out you. He wants to take out your marriage. He wants to take out your kids. He wants to take out your family. He wants to just kind of cheat and steal and destroy, yeah. you know? And I, I, that's, that's a real battle to me. That yeah. that is a honest to goodness daily real battle that I face every day. I got to wake up every day in battle, yeah. And I got to go to war, and I got to have that mentality. All right, so you may have heard it in the background a little bit, but uh, Will was getting his house renovated, so there's a little bit of noise. We took a quick break just for a quick second there, but I figured this is a great opportunity for you to hear one of the biggest audio adrenaline hits and the song that really launched a lot of this ministry that uh, we're talking more in depth about now called Hands and Feet. This is Hands and Feet by Audio Adrenaline. When I say I want to be your hands, I want to be your feet. It's funny you're going to work. Let's talk about going to work. Right now you're having your house renovated. And it sounds like there's a guy going to war with a piece of wood and a saw in the other room. So 
Oh, if you yeah. hear background noise, that's what's going that's on. That's funny. Um, but I mean, you've truly uh, laid down. I mean, you laid down a lot of comfort to go to Haiti for five years with your family, um, and now you know you're 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 really the spokesperson and driving force of Haiti Made. So tell me a little bit about what Haiti Made is all about. What's the heartbeat and and sort of practically how does that that look? Yeah. Oh man. I mean, it's, it's kind of the newfound passion for this season of my life, you know, and, and, um, we started a hands and feet project about 15 years ago. My it's, it's, uh, caring for those. And for those, yeah, for those yeah. who don't know, give us a quick summary of what hands, yeah, and, feet hands was doing. and feet project caring for the orphan and abandoned children of Haiti. That was the original vision. We got down there, we built these buildings and we created a family style care for the students. Um, and we, um, we made some mistakes along the way, but we kept a humble and teachable spirit. We realized that, you know, creating these shiny buildings that, mm. and this incredible fair, care for kids enticed other moms and dads to give up their kids to what they thought might be a better opportunity. So then we joined the fight to really uh, get into family preservation, whatever mm. that would look like. If, if there was a kid that came to our campus from day one, we started the hard work to reunify that child back to its family in some way, shape, wow. or form. And so, and then we said no to a lot of families that even though they were poor, how can we partner with you in another way? Right. Um, because we believe a child in a nuclear family is way better than in any other situation, no matter how great it is. Yeah. Every stat uh, would say that too. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so that was a, a shaking up that was great for us. We, we kind of turned our model on its head and said, hey, how can we fight to put ourselves out of business every day, you know, just mm -hmm. reunite kids. And so we've reunited a lot of kids, but we still have 117 on our campuses that we care for in two locations in Haiti. Wow. And when these students started to grow up, we realized that Haiti's biggest issues were economically driven, were poverty driven. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people with larger families had a hard time caring for, you know, sibling five, six, seven, whatever. And they actually, there's a uh, thing called a Rustavik in Haiti. It's kind of an indentured servanthood where they all actually give up some of those kids to another family member to be a servant because they can't care for them. And those mm. kids will never go to school. They'll never have all the nice things. They'll kind of just be a servant to that family and around the house. So stuff like that happens in Haiti because of poverty reasons. So we're like, what can we do to really push against those poverty? We realized we had to stock the pond mm -hmm. and create opportunities for our own students and to help other families. And wow. so that's, that was the birth of Haiti Made. Haiti Made was what can we make in Haiti provide a job, take back to America, give Haiti's uh, artisan-type people and their really incredible, hardworking, uh, creative, and just entrepreneurial, what, mm -hmm. can we, what can we do to give that spirit a place to thrive and a place to sell? And we knew in America that was the place it was, so we could get new monies influxed into Haiti, we could give people uh, an, you know, like a job that's dignified and, and um, is not a handout, is not going down there and just giving them everything that they want, but it's going, hey, if you show up and work a day, you you get a day's page and or sorry, you get a day's pay and you go home and you feed your family. You yeah. know? So Haiti made it started just with that simple idea. We've got to create an opportunity for our students that transition out of hands and feet. We've given them this incredible care. We've poured all this uh, you know, all of our incredible donors money into incredible care for these students, but we're just going to throw them out into the same poverty cycles, and we, we, couldn't, we couldn't live with that. So that's, Haiti May was born to create products to sell in America, to create jobs in Haiti, and to, to give everyone a chance to uh, have a living, to, to pursue their dreams, and, and to provide for their families, you know? What do some of those products look like? Well, uh, we're at HaitiMade.com, you know, yep. so it's a bunch of leather goods right now. Very cool. But we also do some some crochet and knit items, beanies and stuff like that, scarves and wool hats and stuff like that. Okay. Um, we've made jewelry in the past. Kind of the four lanes that Haiti Made lives in is, is HaitiMade.com. It's a retail space, so we create awesome stuff for that. Uh, we have a boutique model where if you're a boutique out there and you want to sell a Haiti Made bag or a Haiti Made item, you can contact us and we can do Haiti made wholesale model with you. And then mm -hmm. we do promotional marketing for companies. We'll stamp a company logo on pretty much anything we do or make or wow. a custom item. Uh, 
you know, and then we also are at the end of the day, we're just a manufacturing team. And so if you're a company that wants to do a little bit of an offshore model, we can put the team together to give you a cheap labor source and to, uh, you know, to bring your, your work over to Haiti and we will make your items in excellence and get it back to you. And, and you're doing a, a, a people group an incredible, um, uh, giving them an incredible blessing by giving them work and an opportunity to feed their family and to make that. your goods. So, well, I'll tell you, tell you what, um, we're going to make sure to, when I get home, I'm going to go on Haiti made and purchase a few items myself. Oh, we're going to give away on this podcast. Awesome. Um, we, cause there's, there's no way I'm asking for uh, promotional items for, uh, something like this. So, um, I will, I will buy them out of pocket and we'll make sure oh, that we do gosh. a giveaway for some of our listeners. Uh, and I want to encourage you right now. Um, I, I normally don't give listeners permission to turn off this podcast, but if there's one time, I would say go to the show notes and visit Haiti Made's website. It is www.haitimade.com. Yep. Very, very simple. Um, yep. Just as we get get ready to kind of wrap up, yeah. Tell me about uh, one of these success stories that we can we can celebrate with you in that that has happened since launching Haiti made yeah yeah well I mean we uh, as we went into fourth quarter last year we had almost a hundred Haitians working wow. and it had grown underneath hands and feet it was under a nonprofit, and um, it would it, it, had, it had started to kind of like I said help the transitioning students and then we also were helping some moms who we really wanted to support to keep their families together maybe about 15 people. And then so to see it in two and a half years to go to about 100 people, um, and it it encompasses, you know, students from hands and feet, and it was encompassing students from rural Haiti, you know, Mm -hmm. the little community of Grand Guave and Tozen. And uh, it was encompassing moms who were fighting to keep their families together. And we had young buck Haitian men and women who were in university, and it was a way for them to, to pay for furthering their education. And, uh, you know, and then people were just coming to work, and they knew what their work was was producing. Yeah. You know, it was producing a fruit, and that fruit was, you know, money that that fair living wage that they were earning. Because we pay, we try to pay uh, twice Haiti's minimum wage, and we wow. try to pay a, uh, you know, a fair living wage that they can go home and they can actually do something with. And, and furthermore, and, the the sense of of accomplishment. Yeah. That that they earn they earn this. That's right, and but not only that, just showcasing their incredible talents. I mean, uh, they're, ha- Haiti has such a beautiful people group. Yeah, I mean they're colorful, they're animated. Um, you know, warm climate cultures and just a loving people. It's it's good morning and good afternoon, mm-hmm. good night every day, and it's how are you and and how's your family and. And for them to showcase their real skill set, which is just artisan and craft related. So that's just a beautiful thing. So you'll see a heart and a spirit and a just a real cool character to every unique piece of Haiti made item that you see on the website. So they're one of a kind. They're an art piece, really. You can't mass produce it. It's all handmade. It's very little. There's no machinery. We're off the grid. Yeah. You know, we have solar and, and that's our only only energy source. So it's it's all handmade and very uh very um you know one of a kind special stuff so well i mean and even as i just look at the site now and just kind of just browse around like this is not cheap material that people are just buying because they feel they feel bad and want to help right. someone out we it's, don't, this we is don't good want material to sympathy buy. we no. don't want to sympathy buy no, it's for great sure. material and it says something about the culture uh that you guys are helping to foster to to yeah. really show these Haitians that they have abilities and skills and talents yeah, that's right and helping them succeed so um man i commend you in that and i love that love what you're doing um thanks for taking time today appreciate it oh, you're epic i appreciate you man man well this is josh mccabe here on overflow beyond the music with will mcginnis check out this throwback audio a song as we close <laughs> off this podcast <laughs>
All right, we've come to the end. Major thanks to Will McGinnis for hanging out today on Overflow Beyond the Music, the podcast. Make sure, again, you go to his website, HadyMade.com. It'll be in the show notes along with an amazing playlist of some uh, audio adrenaline tunes. So make sure that you check out those show notes. And again, we're giving away some Kim Walker Smith books. Make sure that you follow us on Instagram, Overflow BTM, and check that out. Get in on the contest. Again, screenshot you listening to this podcast, post it, tag us, and you could win uh, with the signed Kim Walker Smith books. My name is Josh McCabe. You can follow me online at Josh McCabe Music on Instagram. Would love to connect with you there. We'll see you again next time. Thanks for tuning in to Overflow Beyond the Music. Oh, yeah! We're going to take you up.